listen only mode. Welcome, everyone, to an introduction to Back Illuminated S CMOS camera technology, a webinar presented by Princeton Instruments and hosted by Photonics Media. My name is Robin Riley, and I am the web editor at Photonics Media. Our speaker today is Ravi Guntapali, VP of Sales and Marketing at Princeton Instruments. Today, Ravi will discuss scientific CMOS camera technology and how it compares to CCD, EMCCD, and ICCD low light imaging and spectroscopy detectors. A quick technical note before we begin. If you have any problems, the easiest thing to do is to log out and log back in to rejoin the webinar. A recording will be available later today on our website if you miss any part of the presentation. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. Just type your question in the question box. We will answer as many as possible at the end of the session. Before we begin, we would like to take a quick poll. And the question will be, do you currently use a CMOS camera? Yes or no? And I'll give people a few more seconds to respond to that poll. OK, I'm going to just close the poll now. And I'm going to share the, the results. OK, thank you very much. And I am now going to hide the poll and turn control of the screen over to our presenter. Welcome, Ravi. Please begin. Thank you, Robin. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ravi Guntupalli. I'm uh, Vice President at uh, Princeton Instruments. Um, and uh, thanks for uh, Photonics Media for uh, hosting this uh, webinar um, on a pretty exciting new low light detection technology called uh, Back Illuminated uh, Scientific CMOS. Um, in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, uh, I hope to take you through uh, a brief introduction of this uh, technology and uh, also importantly, uh, how it compares and contrasts with the uh, existing low light level detection uh, that's available. For those of you who may not be familiar with Princeton Instruments, uh, we are a world leader in the low light scientific imaging, spectroscopy, and x-ray technologies. Uh, we are located in uh, uh, New Jersey and Massachusetts in the United States. I'm actually speaking to you from our New Jersey office. And uh, we have uh, subsidiaries in uh, Europe and Asia, also uh, global uh, representatives uh, elsewhere in the world. Our primary technologies uh, that uh, Princeton is known for um, is low light level detection uh, cameras and that include, uh, some of you might have heard these terms, CCDs uh, uh, now with the, for first four a into scientific CMOS, electron multiplied CCDs, intensified CCDs, and we also uh, recently introduced uh, a combination of uh, electron multiplication and intensified CCDs called EMI CCDs. And also uh, we are known for um, low light infrared detectors uh, based on indium gallium arsenide technology. And, uh, um, we pride ourselves in uh, making low noise uh, deep cooled uh, cameras for uh, research applications. Uh, in addition, for spectroscopy primarily, uh, we've been designing uh, spectrometers uh, with our Acton research um, uh, brand. And uh, recently, we have uh, uh, come to uh, these aberration-free designs uh, that corrects for 
uh, optical operations uh, that have plagued uh, spectrometers for a long time. And uh, also we have uh, uh, in-house developed software packages that supports all our hardware. And, uh, and most of you may not know is we have an Acton Optics division that actually you know, caters to um, optical coating uh, requirements, uh, primarily in deep UV. And so a lot of our hardware take advantage of our in-house capabilities in the optics as well. For the last five to six years, uh, we uh, developed uh, quite a few um, exclusive uh, uh, or proprietary technologies uh, from Princeton. Uh, one of them, uh, just a sample or list, uh, Exelon. Uh, we have developed this uh, uh, to broaden the sensitivity of back illuminated uh, CCD and EMC CDs. Uh, uh, and this has been become a very popular choice uh, for uh, scientific imaging and spectroscopy. And we have a Nirvana line of uh, indium gal marcinate cameras. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, latest publications for in vivo or whole animal imaging or semiconductor failure analysis, uh, you would uh, see this uh, camera. And uh, also, uh, one of the very first technologies are the camera technologies that come out of Princeton Instruments. Uh, we are uh, now a little over three decades of uh, experience is uh, our intensified cameras. These are gated intensified CCD cameras. And also um, we have a, a series of uh, EM CCDs. Um, uh, lately they've uh, gotten, gotten a lot faster and we call it Pro EMHS line. And uh, we talked about spectrographs, and of course, um, this technology that, that we will be focusing today is the back illuminated SCMOS uh, technology. Uh, we call uh, this camera line Kuro. Uh, we'll uh, go through that in more detail today, and of course, the software. And uh, we have a, an integrated uh, spectroscopy um, instrument called Fergie uh, that we launched uh, at the Photonics West. And we are known for uh, uh, complete solutions, uh, including hardware and software. Software is uh, our software is called Lightfield, uh, that uh, supports all the features of uh, um, all our cameras, spectrometers, and of course uh, all the um, post uh, analysis um, needs. So today's agenda, um, I looked at the list of registrars uh, for this webinar. Um, uh, it's it's good to see that uh, there are a lot of varied background we are coming from. So just so that to bring everybody on a same level playing field, I will um, give a, a, a small introduction to what really constitute um, scientific low light level detectors and uh, go into uh, principles of operation of uh, CCD and CMOS. And then um, uh, uh, the crux of the, this discussion is the front illuminated versus back illuminated. Um, what is the main difference or differences um, are. And also um, some of you are interested in, uh, uh, probably are asking this question, uh, this technology is great but uh, is it really for me or for my application? So I would like to answer that question um, towards the end of this uh, uh, webinar. And of course I'm um, open to answering any questions at the end, uh, feel free to uh, jump in there. So um, this is a statement that uh, we use uh, when somebody asks us, uh, you know, what are really low light level cameras? These cameras are uh, designed to capture light from, um, you know, tiniest of cells to stellar objects. Um, so uh, indeed, the low light level uh, uh, detectors are behind some of the most uh, um, astounding discoveries uh, over the years. Um, so they are quantitative. Uh, this is the uh, one of the word that uh, will come um, uh, more times in this discussion. Um, they help us by capturing the light. They help us understand the the processes in the biological and physical um, uh, systems. Um, so most of the time they're done 
uh, in a non-contact or optical diagnostic techniques. Okay. And there are a lot of features uh, that have uh, become available in these detectors over the years. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, they're able to detect anywhere from single photons to hundreds and thousands of photons. Um, so they, are, they have a wide dynamic range. Uh, the wavelength range, uh, of course, photonic detectors uh, range uh, extends far better, 200 to 1100 nanometer for uh, what we call an optical detectors. And they are uh, known for uh, low read noise and uh, dark current and, of course, uh, a lot of researchers require uh, uh, flexibility with those detectors. Um, they just uh, are not satisfied with just getting an image or a spectrum from the camera. They, they would like a lot of um, uh, flexibility from those. So here is a triangle. Um, I did not list all the the requirements or specifications uh, that uh, you would normally find on a uh, on a data sheet, but if you look at it, these four, quantum efficiency, which is essentially a fraction of incident photons detected. Uh, so this is a really an important starting point for looking at any low light level uh, detector. And noise, its noise is obviously unwanted. Um, this is, we want as minimum noise as possible. And uh, this is going to uh, determine what is the lowest level of signal that uh, a, a given detector can C. And of course, if you have a, a process that's a dynamic or kinetic process, you would like uh, the detector to capture light at a faster rate than what you're, uh, not what you're trying to observe. So that's frame rate is important, a certain um, time, and quantitative. And uh, it's not just enough to capture an image. Um, uh, most of our detectors are used for publications and the scientific journals, so they need to uh, produce uh, linear reproducible results over and over. Okay. As I said, there are a lot of other uh, features and specifications that, uh, uh, that are important depending on your application. Uh, we can go into more detail as uh, uh, discussions arise. Okay. So um, here is an uh, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, a part, part portion of it. Uh, that goes from X-rays uh, in the left, which is a high energy uh, photons, all the way to um, long wave IR, or infrared region, uh, with the uh, energy of the photon is uh, smaller. So its uh, wavelength is uh, inversely proportional to the, the energy of the photon. For most of this region, uh, that is uh, below 200 nanometers to 1100 nanometer, uh, silicon is uh, being used as a, a primary uh, detector. Of, uh, that so, if you uh, have used or if you have heard about CCD or uh, uh, EMCCD or CMOS, um, they're all made of uh, silicon. So this is a pretty good material. But after you cross 1100 nanometer, due to band gap limitations. Um, the silicon-based detectors uh, no longer work. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, different materials uh, such as uh, indium gallium arsenide or ingas, um, mercury cadmium telluride or MCT, lead sulfide or zinc selenide type detectors are used uh, in uh, uh, the far in, or short wave infrared, mid wave infrared, and long wave infrared. So that gives you just a basic outline of what kind of optical detectors are used um, in this region. So one of the, f the first silicon-based detectors are CCDs. Uh, these uh, were invented by uh, Willard Boyle and uh, George Smith uh, in 1969 at Bell Labs, actually not too far from uh, where I'm speaking you, uh, where I'm speaking from. Um, They've been the detector of choice for a lot of um, scientific uh, applications. Um, as you can see, they have a lot of desirable attributes, um, like uh, greater than 95% quantum efficiency. And they have a 100% pixel full factor, um, you know, sub-electron read noise with the advent of uh, EMCCDs. Uh, they're known for excellent linearity. Uh, they don't have fixed parents. So all the, the, 
they've been developed over time in multiple formats. And, um, so that's let's say really uh, drove the low light level uh, applications. If you look at various kinds, um, there are three types of detectors uh, that uh, I will focus today. Um, the far left is the what we call a standard CCD architecture. Um, I actually showed a cartoon of a, a full frame CCD. Um, you have a grid of pixels um, where photons or incident photons generate uh, through photoelectric effect um, uh, charge or electrons and which are then shifted towards the serial register and then read out uh, through preamplifier and analog to digital converters uh, to generate digital counts. So that's the image you see on the screen. So that's the basic concept of how CCD operates. In the middle, uh, more recently, uh, uh, the EMCCD or electron multiplication CCD has become available. Again, it uh, definitely uh, enabled a lot of applications that weren't uh, possible with CCD only. So it, the operation is obviously very similar to CCD except if you notice on the uh, serial register is now extended uh, to have what we call an electron multiplication. So uh, in the pixels, the four electrons are generated, they're transferred, or uh, they're moved towards the serial register, but in the extended uh, register portion, they're amplified uh, through a process known as impact ionization to create additional signal. So essentially, this technology allowed us to uh, achieve um, sub one electron read noise uh, for single photon detection. On the far right is uh, another variant of uh, uh, CCD or EMCCD is now that's fiber optically coupled. Fiber optic is in the middle portion um, here. That's attached to an intensifier. Uh, here a cross section of the intensifier is shown. Um, it's, this is a, a, a one of the unique um, low light level detectors uh, that is still holds their place because of uh, ability to do gating or uh, extremely short exposure times. Uh, we're talking in terms of sub nanosecond uh, to microsecond type uh, uh, exposures. So these are the technologies that um, have been known. Uh, probably some of you might have already used this kind of uh, detectors. So come to CMOS. Uh, um, of course, CMOS is uh, become more prevalent. Uh, it's designed in 1990s uh, at Jet Propulsion Labs. That was the first CMOS uh, uh, architecture was developed. The difference is here: each pixel contains uh, CMOS pixel contains uh, a charge to a voltage conversion um, using the transistors. So a part of the pixel is taken up by the, this electronic structure. And then they are read out, uh, typically column-wise fashion, uh, using a multiple uh, readout uh, channels. Uh, right away, you can see um, the, some of the advantages of CMOS. Because of this parallel nature of the readout, they are uh, able to go much faster or much higher frame rate uh, than CCDs uh, can. On the other hand, you can also see uh, a, a disadvantage. Uh, it's called a fill factor. That means because electronic structures are occupying a portion of the pixel, um, not all at the entire pixel is uh, photosensitive. So that's uh, determined by, uh, that's usually referred to as fill factor. So photosensitive area over total pixel area. So that's. Uh, um, how the CMOS uh, uh, cameras or CMOS sensors work. So I just want to take you through just uh, quickly uh, what we mean by front illumination. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, this refers to um, either CCD or CMOS. Um, you know, what you're looking at here is a, uh, the, the brown portion of this picture is the, uh, what we call a, um, uh, silicon where an actual uh, photo detection takes place. That's where the photoelectric take, uh, effect takes place. And uh, the photons are shown by way of you know, 
that looks like a uh, rain. Uh, those are uh, photons. In front illumination, they first uh, have to go through uh, a dielectric layer or what we call a, a uh, polysilicon gates. And, and the, before they reach uh, the actual uh, the depletion zone in the detector. Because they have to, uh, you know, some of them are reflected off of the, uh, the front surface, and they typically have a lower quantum efficiency. Um, they could be anywhere from 30% to 80%, uh, typical is more like 55%. Okay. Uh, but because uh, these are uh, uh, fundamentally how most of the detectors start out, they're inexpensive, um, so that's the, the advantage. Um, but if you look at the back illumination, and I go back again here, and that's the front illumination and the back illumination, here uh, now the brown portion is now actually directly looking at the light, or the photons are incident on the uh, photosensitive area. Uh, and, and the readout architecture is at the bottom of the, um, these sensors. Right away, you can see uh, that's, that substrate is also thinned down so that uh, uh, the more of them are captured uh, in the substrate. And you can expect, uh, you know, definitely greater than 90%, uh, 95% is, is possible uh, with this back elimination. And, uh, you know, the same technology used in EMC cities are capable of advantage of this back illumination is because there's no, uh, uh, none of this, uh, the electronic structures are uh, impeding this UV photons, they also tend to be more UV sensitive. And uh, the disadvantage is uh, they are more expensive because of the additional processing steps involved. And another thing that to uh, keep in mind, um, mostly for spectroscopy, uh, you need to uh, understand a phenomenon called etaloning or fringing in the near infrared region. I will talk briefly about that later. Okay. So there is a variant of a back illumination technology or deep depletion technology that's available. Um, you know, it's a, right now it's only available in CCDs um, more prominently. It, it is designed to reduce etaloning and increase the near infrared sensitivity. Um, so they definitely are better, um, but uh, they tend to have a higher dark current. Uh, so, if you think about it, all or almost all um, the low light level are, uh, detectors that are designed for extreme uh, uh, low light level detection are back illuminated. So you might be wondering. Uh, when is this going to be available for CMOS? Um, uh, so fortunately, uh, we can say yes to that answer. Um, so now, uh, back illuminated CMOS is available. Uh, it's definitely a, a, a next generation CMOS, uh, but interestingly, uh, you might actually be using this technology in your hand. Uh, if uh, any of you are, have used uh, the latest generation iPhone or uh, um, any other uh, smartphone device, uh, most likely it uses a uh, what they call a backside illuminated uh, sensor. So the the push uh, came from consumer electronics uh, uh, to go backside because as they tend to be smaller pixels, um, to get around this fill factor uh, issue, uh, the best way to do it is to flip the uh, sensor and expose all of the uh, the sensor area to photons. That's how they get the extreme sensitivity. In this graphic on the left side, uh, I, here is a front illuminated uh, um, SCMOS sensor which appears reflective uh, because uh, the incident photons are uh, uh, reflected off the uh, structures uh, inside uh, on top of the surface. On the right side, you have a back illuminated sensor uh, that absorbs most of the um, the photons instant. And another thing that uh, uh, it's instructive for all of us to understand is pixel size. Of course, a smaller pixel size gives you higher resolution. 
which is good in some applications, uh, but uh, especially photon starving applications, actually bigger pixels are, uh, are better because number of photons uh, are, are detected per pixel uh, can be high. For example, it is a 11 micron by 11 micron um, back illuminated CMOS on the right side captures uh, 2.9 times, uh, almost three times more photons per pixel. So something to keep in mind uh, when you're evaluating uh, uh, low light level detectors. So here is a, uh, a quantum efficiency of uh, this back illuminated uh, S CMOS, which is a red uh, curve. And uh, also shown are the previous generation S CMOS cameras. As you can see, uh, front illuminated CMOS cameras have steadily improved uh, from anywhere from uh, mid 60s to now uh, some of them claim to have uh, like greater than 80 uh, percent peak quantum efficiencies. Um, compared to that, uh, back illuminated S CMOS um, has a much um, better quantum efficiency across the board, but uh, especially if you look at it, it's got peak quantum efficiency of 95 percent. And not only that, and you can see it's got excellent UV response um, just from the fact that uh, the UV photons don't get um, uh, absorbed for anything before they reach the, um, the depletion region. So just a kind of uh, understanding a little more about uh, where these quantum efficiency differences come from, you got to understand how these CMOS uh, sensors are typically fabricated. On the left-hand side is a front illuminated uh, uh, CMOS uh, that uses uh, what's called micro lenses. So these are micro lenses are structures that are uh, uh, laid on top of each pixel to refocus the light into the photosensitive area of the pixel. So um, they've, in fact, uh, there's been a lot of research done to improve these structures so that more light goes into those photosites. Um, uh, so this is more, uh, most of the time these are proprietary for the fab that's used to manufacture the sensor. Uh, so while they help refocus the light, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, one of the lesser known or lesser published uh, uh, data is they do reduce um, sensitivity or the quantum efficiency at non-normal angles. So when the light inc is incident uh, perpendicular to the sensor surface, uh, they work the best. That means at the edges of the sensor or when you're using a very fast optic in front of the camera, they don't work as efficiently. So effective QE is reduced. Because of the materials used uh, in these micro uh, uh, to form these micro lenses, they normally do not transmit in UV. Uh, in fact, if you look at the quantum efficiency curve, um, um, you saw that it only shows up to 400 nanometers in front, front illuminated. And also there's uh, lesser known effects as crosstalk um, um, in uh, front illuminated SCMOS. Okay. On the other hand, on the right hand side, you see the back illuminated uh, 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 SCMOS sensor. Uh, light goes directly uh, into the pixel and 100% of the pixel area is uh, photosensitive. So uh, that's the re reason for uh, very high quantum efficiency and uh, another uh, the important thing to keep in mind is uh, there is no angular dependence uh, to that uh, quantum efficiency. So that quantum efficiency, you get it even when you're using fast uh, optics. Here is the uh, same QE curve again. If you want to look at what is the real effective QE of uh, uh, back illuminators, front illuminate. So you can see um, the back illuminated uh, CMOS, which is the red trace, uh, you can achieve uh, that QE at that, all incident angles, whereas if you take the effective QE uh, as a, f a function of uh, incident angle, um, frontal illuminated uh, CMOS uh, has got a lower QE. Uh, at the extreme angles, it could be as uh, low as two to three times uh, lower than uh, uh, when it is a, a normal instance QE. So this is something to keep in mind. Uh, they, they, they may not be 
very important if you have a lot of light. Uh, but uh, we are especially talking about uh, photon starved applications. So in these cases, uh, this type of angle dependence matters. Okay. Um, I promise you this is the only equation in this presentation, but I think it is one of the fundamental um, uh, equations that defines any photonic detector uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. Signal to noise ratio is uh, ultimately uh, it's what uh, gives us the best uh, performance of the, uh, any detector. So you can use this um, equation for uh, comparing not only uh, different CMOS, but you can also compare CMOS with the CCD and ICC and etc. Um, looks complicated, but uh, in, in, in reality it's, it's not. Uh, so on the numerator, you have S uh, stands for a detected number of photons. Um, simply, uh, how many photons are incident, you know, you multiply that by a quantum efficiency, you get a uh, number of photons, so that's your signal. Uh, in the denominator, you get uh, three terms. Um, one is a what we call a short noise term. I will go talk to you more about that F. And then you have a uh, thermal or dark noise. And then we call it what we call a noise. So in the uh, uh, for detectors that have a built-in amplification mechanism, uh, such as uh, EMCCD or intensified CCD cameras. There is a, an additional term uh, here. It's uh, uh, shown as F, as an excess noise factor uh, that comes into play. Um, so this is the, uh, uh, most of you uh, might know that this amplification or multiplication process is a stochastic in nature. That means um, it does introduce uh, excess noise by way of uh, amplification. So that F is, uh, it can range from anywhere from 1.2 uh, for EMCCD to intensifier that can range into 2 to 2.2. So if you do a, a, a simple map and if you have a, an ideal detector and where these uh, uh, dark noise is zero and the read noise is zero um, uh, and uh, excess noise factor is one, uh, the best signal to noise ratio you will get is a short noise limited. In fact, that's our goal uh, to design a short noise limited detector. Um, but in reality, of course, you know we fall short of that uh, that goal because of the various uh, noise sources there. So, based on that uh, the equation, if you compare the signal to noise ratio, here is a theoretical curves of different. Uh, detector types. Red curve is a back illuminated uh, uh, SCMOS. Uh, this is a uh, based on our uh, Kuro camera, which has got about a one and a half electron um, read noise and 95 percent quantum efficiency. Um, so, and the yellow curve is the EMCCD. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you look uh, look towards the left side. does get better signal to noise ratio when you're in the single photon range. <coughs> Sorry. Um, whereas a uh, green curve, uh, which um, refers to uh, intensified CCDs, does have a lower signal to noise ratio, but, but their unique ability to do uh, short gating uh, trumps uh, even this uh, lower signal to noise ratio. Uh, and the frontal limited SCMOS uh, with and without a normal incidence is shown in this uh, dotted blue lines. So um, this SEMOS cameras, um, they're natively um, capable of uh, getting a very high frame rates and um, uh, low read noise. Uh, so this has not been possible with the CCD technology. For example, uh, it's just a, a sample set of frame rates. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, 1200 by 1200, uh, you can achieve uh, 41 to 82 frames per second 
uh, in two different modes. Uh, in the 12-bit mode, uh, what we call a high gain mode, it's capable of doing 82 frames per second. So um, very high data throughput. Um, uh, they're designed for high frame rate uh, applications at the same time, uh, low light. So this gives you unique combination um, that's uh, hitherto not been possible. Uh, other things um, that you will notice once you start using the cameras uh, is uh, here is a uh, one performance feature uh, that you might notice it right away when you're using this latest back illuminated uh, CMOS is uh, fixed pattern. So here is an example of uh, a rescaled uh, graph to show the fixed pattern that's come by way of uh, reading out through multiple uh, readout ports. Uh, to a back illuminated CMOS, it's got a much uh, more uniform or much more random background um, in the pattern. So the manufacturing or the fabrication technology improvements um, really help uh, back end devices to get a more uniform background on the readout uh, electronics as well. Because uh, we cater to both uh, imaging and spectroscopy customers, uh, another thing we, uh, especially at Princeton Instruments, We've looked at uh, ethyloning performance. Um, uh, so ethyloning occurs in near infrared region, uh, primarily over 700 uh, to 750 nanometers. Uh, this occurs uh, due to constructive and destructive interferences of the incident photons um, that uh, uh, that cause uh, what we call fringes. Uh, we looked at uh, because we have a uh, uh, a spectrometer and a uniform light source. Uh, here are some examples of how ethyloning looks. It's actually uh, it's better than uh, we expected how this detector to perform um, all the way up to 700 to 940 nanometers. So it is a, a viable candidate for uh, near infrared uh, region as well. So anybody is interested in this uh, near infrared region, we can actually provide you with this uh, data, you know, more detailed data as well. So in summary, um, back illuminated uh, uh, scientific CMOS uh, is definitely as a, 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 an improved performance all around, uh, not just the uh, quantum efficiency, um, but also uh, in the less fixed pattern noise and uh, being able to detect in UV, uh, uh, extreme UV range as well. <coughs> Um, another thing that uh, I just want to point out, uh, at the same time, um, we are uh, coming out with these uh, uh, higher sensitive uh, uh, CMOS or uh, EMCCD type uh, uh, cameras. Uh, you need to, uh, um, uh, actually we're all fortunate that we actually uh, uh, came out with these aberration free spectrographs that can truly take advantage of these uh, these latest detectors. Um, the reason is uh, normally uh, if you're using a, a camera for uh, spectroscopy, um, uh, uh, traditional designs because of this optical aberrations, uh, they can't take advantage of the smaller pixel uh, uh, devices. Uh, normally, uh, any uh, sub 15 micron pixel uh, CCDs. Uh, cannot be fully resolved uh, using uh, spectrometers. But this aberration-free designs, uh, uh, like uh, our isoplane, uh, they can now take advantage of them. And you can uh, uh, more and more uh, customers are uh, using the same detector for imaging and spectroscopy and uh, taking the full advantage of focal plane area. So that's a really um, interesting uh, turn of uh, uh, events at this point. And another sign of uh, uh, technology uh, maturity is uh, not just hardware, but uh, there's an ecosystem that gets developed around the technology. When that happens, you know, OK, uh, you can start uh, considering this for uh, uh, various applications. For example, we have our light field, which uh, fully supports uh, our uh, SCMOS uh, cameras. Not only that, uh, we have support for uh, uh, third-party software uh, packages like LabVIEW, MATLAB, and EPIX. So <clears throat> not a, and uh, one thing to uh, keep in mind is uh, because of the data rates are, are extremely high, uh, this is 82 frames per second 
um, at 1200 by 1200. And it's important for you to do some online analysis as the data coming from the camera. So some of the software packages are like Lightfield are capable of doing online or inline processing uh, as the data comes from, from the camera. So what are the applications? Um, uh, it's they range uh, the whole gamut. Um, you know, here is uh, some of the um, astronomy uh, images captured using our, our Kuro cameras. Um, uh, quantum imaging. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the some of the quantum imaging applications can be uh, take advantage of this high frame rate, low noise uh, applications. Imaging. Uh, there are um, uh, low light fluorescence, um, uh, the microscopy applications that can take advantage of this um, backillumination CMOS, and uh, some of the uh, more material testing applications such as uh, uh, solar or uh, some of the hyperspectral imaging or hyperspectroscopy uh, or microspectroscopy images. Imaging can be used uh, use this uh, latest generation uh, detectors as well. So we haven't explored all the applications um, uh, since the announcement. The, we really got um, a, a great enthusiasm for the technology. And I'm pretty sure uh, it, 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 this is the technology that's going to stay here for a while and grow uh, across uh, many more applications. So to close out uh, the discussion, um, this is the question we get asked uh, uh, more often than not: Is what detector should I, or what detector technology should I uh, be using? Yeah, when uh, you have so many uh, choices and uh, uh, different uh, the pros and cons in front of you, uh, it might look like it's difficult. Actually, it may not be as difficult as uh, one might think. So, let's say you have CCD, EMCCD. Uh, uh, ICCD or EMICCD, and now with the new generation of back illuminated uh, CMOS, what would you choose? <coughs> so I, I provided a a, a simple table. Um, by the way, this is also available in our uh, on our website. Um, if um, you have a, uh, a back illuminated CCD, is ideal if you're starting to uh, see. Uh, a milliseconds to hours. That means extended uh, integration times, uh, mostly steady state applications. So the CCDs are still uh, the ideal choice for those. Uh, in fact, um, uh, extremely low light Raman and uh, astronomy applications, uh, they still use uh, CCDs. So there's really nothing else that beats uh, the CCD cameras. But if you're Time scales are uh, shorter, um, you know, into microseconds, seconds, maybe sometimes minutes. Um, back illuminated EMCCDs are an ideal choice, and uh, uh, also uh, some of these photon counting or photon detection, single photon detection applications, um, uh, they definitely benefit from EMCCD. So they have a place uh, where they are uh, uh, more convenient or uh, more capable. Um, Intensified CCD cameras, um, actually, there is no question. Uh, as soon as you start to take uh, taking uh, extremely short exposure times, uh, what we call a single shot events, um, they are uh, uh, detector of choice. So uh, for example, our PI Max 4 cameras are capable of doing uh, less than 500 picoseconds. And of course, you can do seconds of exposure, uh, but and uh, more, uh, uh, more often they're uh, meant for uh, time dissolved imaging and uh, spectroscopy in uh, nanosecond or microsecond range. <laughs> but the new entrant, uh, the back illuminated CMOS, um, right now they are uh, capable of taking only a few seconds. Uh, they are not capable of taking uh, minutes or hours like CCDs or uh, even EMCCDs. So, uh, for example, the Kuro camera is limited to 10 second uh, integration time. And uh, definitely, because of the um, quantum efficiency, um, uh, lower read noise, uh, and being able to 
uh, take uh, um, the high frame rate uh, like you know 40 to 80 frames per second or uh, thousands of frames per second that's about all uh, they are uh, at least y you should uh, take a look at it and see if it uh, works for your application so that kind of breaks it down and uh, which way you would like to go uh, with uh, uh, this new back illuminated SCMOS so to close out um, back illuminated uh, SCMOS cameras are uh, definitely superior to front illuminated designs uh, that uh, they uh, uh, are available on the market right now. Uh, so two main reasons. Uh, one is obvious, it's a back illuminated, it's 94% peak QE and uh, lack of micro lenses is actually beneficial uh, to uh, get uh, the, the traditional benefit of 100% um, uh, fill, fill factor and no angular dependence. <coughs> So, in uh, and the the choice is uh, it's broader, uh, but uh, as the time goes on, uh, each detector type is going to find its place. Uh, but uh, CCDs are still good for extended integration times. EM CCDs are for single photon uh, uh, level uh, applications and uh, gated applications, ICCD, and the high frame rate, short integration times now probably can be accomplished with the uh, back lunar decimos uh, cameras okay uh, with that I uh, thank you very much for your attention uh, definitely uh, you're welcome to visit our website princetoninstruments.com uh, it's got helpful uh, technical notes um, and uh, uh, some other specifications that I have not discussed uh, on this uh, this presentation and uh, as Robin pointed out, uh, this webinar is being recorded and uh, it can be accessed both on our website as well as Photonics Media. And, uh, thank you. Thank you Th very much. Thank you very much, Ravi. And um, thank you very much for an informative webinar. And if you um, have questions for our speaker, now is the time to enter them in the questions box. And meanwhile, Ravi, I do have a few questions here for you, beginning with, is, excuse me, is the Coro back illuminated SCMOS camera available for demonstration? Um, yes. Um, you can contact uh, your local Princeton Instruments representative. Um, so we have uh, launched this uh, camera at the end of last year uh, it's available and uh, definitely I encourage you to contact uh, your local PI rep. Okay very good thank you. What is the minimum gate time on SCMOS Coro? So uh, the minimum exposure time uh, that's what I, I believe he's asking is a uh, it's a microsecond to millisecond range. Uh, it is not capable of taking a, a, a nanosecond range like ICCD. Okay. okay, thank you. Can you compare pixel crosstalk in SCMOS and CCD? Yeah, we have not done um, a direct comparison. Uh, that's something that we can uh, do. Uh, using our high resolution spectrometers uh, the, the narrow line widths uh, but uh, we can definitely provide you with that data when it is available uh, offline but we expect uh, pixel crosstalk to be similar to that of uh, CCD okay thank you and are the SCMOS sensors are they perfectly linear like CCDs Yes, uh, perfectly linear. Perfect is a, a relative term. Um, see, uh, with the, we test all our cameras, including our CMOS, using a photon transfer curves. Um, so the linearity uh, within the the up to the linear full well, their their linearity is similar to that of uh, CCDs. So. Okay. Thank you. And here's another question. Is, 
Okay, I'm sorry. Is the exposure limit based on dark current or something else? Um, yes, uh, the, uh, it is limited by the, the dark current. Um, one thing to keep in mind is CMOS uh, cameras uh, tend to have lower cooling. Uh, for example, CCDs and EMCCDs, they can be cooled uh, below minus 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, but because of uh, uh, the CMOS architecture and uh, these cameras don't have a similar type of cooling. Uh, for example, Kuro camera only cools to minus 25 degree uh, Celsius. So the dark current is higher and that actually limits uh, usable maximum integration time that you can use. Okay, thank you. Is crosstalk between pixels a greater problem with back illuminated technology? I think it's other way around, I think. Um, is uh, crosstalk, uh, in, uh, at least in the literature, I've referenced um, crosstalk in front illuminated CMOS sensors is, is higher um, than the back illuminated uh, CMOS. Okay, thank you. Can you make it EUV sensitive by back thinning? Yes, actually, uh, if I uh, people can see my screen st still, um, if you look at the quantum efficiency curve, uh, it does already have an uh, excellent uh, quantum efficiency. You can see in the UV region, uh, it can be backed in, in principle uh, to get even better UV response. So if somebody is interested in that uh, extreme UV range, definitely contact us. Okay, thank you. What limits CMOS max acquisition time? Dark noise? And he's just yes. suggesting, okay. Yeah, I, 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 yes, dark, dark current generation uh, definitely limits, but there are other uh, s sources uh, that uh, this, uh, uh, th there's probably some electronic limitations as well on the sensor that limits the maximum exposure time, so. Okay, and we have um, we have a few questions. Um, what is on concerning the costs? Um, so I'll just ask one of them here. What is the relevant? What I'm sorry. What is the relative price range of these technologies for a given resolution? Let's say one m pixel. Yeah. So these uh, back illuminated uh, CMOS uh, the cameras they're cheaper than uh, the EM uh, CCDs, uh, uh, they're obviously more expensive than front illuminated uh, uh, CMOS cameras. Okay, and I just want to mention that um, Ravi is going to be getting all of these questions as well as your contact information, and so he is going to know um, what your questions are and be able to respond to you offline as well. So I will ask a few more questions here, Ravi. You got so many of them. What is the current delivery lead time? Uh, we can deliver pretty quickly. We actually, this camera is in production, so if you're looking for one right now, we can deliver it uh, uh, probably less than four weeks. Okay. And why is, um, it looks like BI, uh, um, why is BI S CMOS limited to 10 S integration time? Yeah. I, I think it's the, the, the dark current and, uh, you know, Dark current probably poses the, the first limitation in that uh, uh, in that exposure time. So, also because of the readout structures that are around the sensor, um, as you start taking uh, an extended integration times, you know it can uh, generate uh, higher uh, background uh, uh, the emission 
uh, that can actually limit the exposure time. So. Okay, thank you very much. And would it work for soft x-ray? In theory, yes. Uh, this should work for soft x-ray depending on your energy range. Uh, so, but that does require uh, uh, vacuum compatible designs. Uh, that's something that uh, we are looking into. Uh, if you're uh, interested in, definitely uh, feel free to contact us offline. Thank you. In which applications do you see BioCMOS help the most? It seems very good for storm slash palm applications. Yeah, so for those applications, uh, yes, uh, uh, we have uh, our sister company, Photometrics. Uh, uh, they've been working with this technology for uh, uh, super resolution microscopy as well as storm palm techniques. Not only that, uh, you've got a, a multitude of applications from astronomy uh, to even uh, in a hyperspectral imaging type application that can take advantage of this uh, new uh, back or back illuminated uh, CMOS. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. What is a single pixel's full well level? And the suggestion is 80K E? Yes. So this is 11 micron by 11 micron pixel. Um, it's got a single pixel full well of 80,000 electrons. Okay, thank you. What is the minimum readout noise to be expected? Uh, oh, probably I did not. Uh, stress that uh, this has got about one and a half electrons um, RMS read noise. Okay, thank you. Is there a published photon transfer curve available from Princeton? Yes, we can give you photon transfer curve. Uh, in fact, we measure uh, electronic gain, electrons per ADU through photon transfer curve, so we can provide you that. Okay, um, this is, um, it's kind of a question, kind of a comment. I am more interested in knowing about the infrared range and in parentheses 850 to 1100 nm. Yeah, so you probably are uh, interested in knowing at learning performance. We actually, I can, uh, I probably I can go to that slide. Uh, we can get you additional data in that uh, region. We have already done some testing uh, in the near infrared region and that provide you that uh, data as well. Okay, thank you. Can you apply a coating to make it EUV sensitive? Uh, I think uh, maybe the, 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 the questioner is asking uh, maybe below 200 nanometers Below 200 nanometers, typically, uh, you don't use any uh, any coatings. Uh, it, this sensor inherently has a very good sensitivity in UV. If you want to go below 200 nanometers, you need a vacuum compatible design. Typically, uh, we recommend no anti-reflective coatings or uh, no conversion coatings below 200 nanometers. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to ask one more question. And again, I want to let everybody know that Ravi will be getting copies of all of your questions. Uh, last question here. Why can't, ba why can't back illuminated S CMOS camera be cooled low temperature, like, for example, 100 degrees Celsius? That's a very good question, actually. So first, uh, for all these CMOS sensors tend to be uh, tend to have a lot more uh, pins uh, that uh, in the package, so very complicated uh, uh, thermal designs. So they also consume more power um, at the higher speed of operation. So that sets a fundamental limit. And the second is um, 
even if you cool it down, um, because there's other sources of noise that limit the ultimate uh, noise levels that this uh, sensors can achieve. So both engineering as well as uh, probably physical limitations of the sensor as it exists now. Um, that's why we cannot cool, uh, or did not normally cool to minus 100 degrees Celsius level. Okay, thank you very, very much. And at this time, I'm going to close the webinar, and I want to thank our attendees and our presenter once again for making this possible. And if you missed any part of today's presentation, you will be able to find the video today, later on today, at photonics.com slash webinars. Once again, thank you for attending today. And Today's webinar presented by Ravi Guntapali of Princeton Instruments and hosted by Photonics Media. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.